good. Yeah, I'm doing great. Um, yeah, so I think on your program it probably says Jim Kearns. Uh, so, yeah, so you get that's who Jim. I work for. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just to give you a brief background on what I do, uh, so Jim is the professor, if you will. That's the easiest way to put it. Um, and we do all things progress diseases. All right. Uh, so I, what I do is I basically run this program. Uh, so I manage the diagnostics lab and also to manage our uh, field research. Uh, we have about 12 people in our program between students and staff. Uh, so we have a pretty pretty robust program. Um, and just like she said, I, I guess Grady talked on terms of the basics of how to make the lab beautiful. All right. So now I'm the guy that. that when things go wrong, what do you do, right? Uh, and things will go wrong, right? Um, if you didn't learn from Grady, I'm sure you talked about how we have cool and warm season grasses in North Carolina, right? Uh, so we can grow them all, but we can't grow any of them very well. They all, they all have problems, right? And that's the most common question I get when I'm in social circles outside of work. You know, what do you do for work? And it kind of depends on how many people it is, whether I really want to tell them what I do, because I know they're going to bombard me with long questions. Just say your side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the worst. That's all corn people stuff I really don't want to hear. But um, um, uh, as you'll see, there are a lot of problems. So um, the, the title is Frequently Asked Questions, and that's just a rough, <clears throat> rough thing, but I kind of want to go over the basics of, of herb gas diseases. Uh, some of these concepts apply to all plants, it's not just herb, uh, but I am going to focus on herb grass. Uh, we'll talk about uh, when things go wrong, what do you do? How do you collect a sample? Where do you send it? Uh, Want to go over what we actually do with the sample, because sometimes I think that's a mystery. People wonder what exactly we do with it. Uh, then we'll talk about, um, I think I picked three of the most common diseases you're likely to see uh, in home homes around here. Or the, the three that I get the most questions about uh, here recently. Uh, if at any point uh, you have a question, don't hesitate to stop me. And you're not going to hurt my feelings, right? It's more important to talk about it in the moment than wait to the end. All right, everybody good with that? Yep. Uh, I would gladly share these slides with anybody that wants them. Uh, you just email me and I'll send you a PDF copy uh, so you don't have to kill yourself taking notes, all right? Uh, a lot of photos. I'll show them. She'll post them. Okay, perfect. All right, everybody ready? Yes, yeah. All right, let the journey begin, all right? Um, how many of you have ever seen this before? How many of you have taken plant pathology or had a plant pathology training, all right? Uh, so it's almost like we're required to show this. Uh, it's a very simple concept, but it's probably the most important concept when it comes to any plant disease, right? Uh, in order to have a disease, we have to have all three of these things occur. Uh, you have to have a host, the pathogen, and the environment. So when we're talking about turf grass, the host is always there, right? Turf grass systems are pretty much perennial crops, if you will. Uh, it's not like uh, row crop agriculture where you're rotating soybeans, corn, cotton, things like that. So we always have the host, right? Uh, the pathogen, when we talk about pathogen, we're talking about the, the things that are, that are doing the damage. So it can be a fungus, it can be a bacteria, it can be a virus, it can be a microscopic worm, a nematode. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that are pathogens, right? Believe it or not, they're almost always there as well, right? So what's left? The environment, right? Uh, and as you'll see, when we go through all the turf examples, the overwhelming majority of our problems are caused by fungi. Does anybody want to guess what fungi I love more than anything else? Water. Water. Water, yeah. So, what have we had the past? Just a little, just a little while. Can't even remember. It's, 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 yeah. 40 days, right. 40 Breaking minutes. records, right? So, plenty of moisture. Fungi love moisture. So, uh, it's when the environment tips in the favor of the fungus is when, is when you see issues. All right. Uh, for cool season grasses, that tends to be in the summer months. Uh, that's when they're at their most stressed period. So, you think about tall fescue. Root and shoot growth are at a minimum, so uh, they're, they're highly susceptible to fungal infection. Uh, for warm season grasses like zoysia grass, Bermuda grass, etc., that's going to be what we call the shoulder season. So fall through winter and into the spring uh, is when you see those diseases that are, that are most severe. All right. Uh, like I said, uh, just key characteristics: fungi love water. Uh, that's very important to understand. Uh, they do call, they do grow and cause disease in a pretty narrow temperature range. Uh, and that does help us predict when we want to make uh, fungicide applications if they're warranted. Or they are everywhere, just like I said. And I think that's something that people really need to understand. Because uh, I run into this a lot with homeowners, right? They'll, they'll, uh, they'll sod their yard, and then two weeks later, they'll eat up with the disease, right? 
Uh, and then they're blaming the sod farmer for sending it to them. Uh, the landscaper brought it on their shoes. They're blaming it on their neighbor, right? <laughs> uh, all these things happen, but odds are it's probably already there in the soil. Uh, you just brought them something nice to eat. The weather was good, and, and they, they came to life, so to speak, right? Uh, their primary role in nature is decomposition. So a lot of our pathogens are what's known as saprophytes. Uh, you know, if it weren't for these, we'd be, you know, up to our eyeballs and sticks and leaves and stuff. Uh, so they do uh, primarily decompose dead stuff. Uh, but when the conditions are favorable, they will turn and, and attack a, a, a living plant, right? Um, when it comes to the environmental parameters that we like to follow, it's pretty simple. Uh, for foliar diseases, we really focus on low nighttime temperatures and leaf wetness duration. Uh, the leaf wetness duration, and when we talk about brown patch later on, is, is key, right? Uh, and, and where that comes into play is people that have their own irrigation systems, right? So when somebody comes home from work and they want to see that irrigation run because it's fun to watch, kids like to play in it, whatever, you're getting that leaf laid wet, and it's going to stay wet all night long and into the following morning until the dew burns off, right? So you, you've got that leaf laid wet for 14 to 16 hours, uh, and, and that alone, you know, can cause some of our diseases to kick off just because you're keeping it wet for too long, right? Now, obviously, when we get into prolonged periods of rainfall, you don't have any control over that. Uh, but the simple timing of irrigation can be huge in some of these foliar diseases. And then low nighttime temperature, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. Go ahead. So what would be a good time to run? I, I, run, I start running at 2 in the morning. That's perfect. Runs for about two hours. That's perfect. Yeah, just as soon as the dew sets at night and the grass is already wet, let it rip. Yep. Uh, we always say the early morning hours, right? And that, that helps if you have automatic irrigation. If you don't, uh, you know, you're pulling a hose around, that, that can be a challenge. You have to get up early and do it. Uh, you know, if you want to do it first thing in the morning, 7, 8 o'clock, while the grass is still wet, it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, but ideally in the middle of the night. And it helps with uh, evaporation, right? You're not losing it uh, to the heat of the day, right? Uh, and then for our root and crown diseases, we look at soil temperature, all right? Uh, I'll talk about that a little more in detail. Uh, if you didn't know, this information is... Uh, the low nighttime temperature you can get just by watching the evening news, right? Just look at the number at the bottom, right? Um, uh, for soil temperature, if you go to the NC State Climate Office, they have a beautiful map that you can click on, uh, and you can choose uh, daily parameters, and you can choose soil temperature, and it'll show you the, the uh, average soil temperature for that day across the entire state. All right? We use it all the time. Uh, very, very handy tool to watch what soil temperatures are doing. All right? Uh, just a few examples of foliar diseases that are somewhat common. Uh, dollar spot, brown patch. Did you get that in the State Climate Office? Yep. Um, go ahead. Have you looked that up? What's that? Have you looked that up? Oh, if you just Google search NC State Climate Office, it'll be the first one. Yeah, it'll come right up. Yep. Very, very handy website. There's a lot of other weather parameters you can look at, too. It gives you access to all the uh, NC State uh, research stations and the weather stations that they have on site at those places, uh, you should be able to find one pretty close to, uh, to your area. There are a lot in this area uh, in the triangles that are pretty easy to find. All right? uh, for foliar diseases, so uh, just showing you just some examples how it does vary depending on, on the fungus, if you will. Uh, dollar spot is very active right now. Uh, we're actually, we started our research trials on that fungus uh, about a week and a half ago because uh, our low nighttime temperatures were consistently above 50. Uh, barring the past couple of nights where we got a little cold, but you know, for the most part, we are in that range right now. Uh, and, and it's not that it happens on any one given night. It has to be over a period of four, five, six nights. You want it to be a continuous thing to know that you're well into that, that temperature range. All right. For brown patch, it's a little bit warmer. So when low nighttime temperature starts getting above 60, uh, that's when you need to start thinking about brown patch, like in tall fescue. And then pythium blight has to be a little hotter. So you're talking about well into the summer uh, once we're consistently staying above 65 at night. All right. Uh, for our root diseases, we go by the soil temperature, uh, and you can see some different things here. Large, body, large batch, I will talk about later, is a very common disease of warm season turf. Uh, we wait for that soil temperature to, to dip below 70. Uh, and why, why, why I'm saying dip below is because we're making applications in the fall uh, if we're going to treat for it. Uh, so we're, we're watching the soil temperature come down in the fall, right, the end of the year, or end of the season, if you will. Uh, spring dead spot is another common disease of, of warm season grasses. And with this one, you got a really big cushion. You got a range, right? So as soon as that soil temperature dilip, dips below 80, you pretty much got up until it reaches 60 to get applications out to, to treat that fungus. Uh, so you got, a, you got a little bit bigger window with that one. <coughs> so, any questions about all that? That's just meant to be a little brief intro, all right? Um, 
So when things happen, what do you do, right? This is the tricky part. Uh, and one of the things that can be tricky is a lot of our diseases can look a lot alike, all right? There are some out there, unfortunately, that are very easy to diagnose. You can pull it up on your phone, you can look at photos and say, yep, that's it, you gotta be that. Things like farrying, um, maybe brown patch, uh, depending on how, you know, how, how much you mess around with this. Uh, but there are a lot of things that can look a lot alike, right? Uh, these are photos that I took some years ago, um, and I have no clue which one's which. There is no way, and I've been doing this for 20 years, and there's no way I can look at those photos and tell you that it's gray leaf spot or pythium blight. Uh, I'm going to have to use at least a hand lens uh, or a microscope, even better, uh, to confirm the presence of which fungus is actually there and, and doing the damage. All right, so that's where it gets tricky. Uh, the other thing is you got to remember there's a lot of things that kill turf reds, right? Um, a lot of people want to knee jerk and assume that it's an insect or a fungus uh, when, when in fact it can be a lot of a lot of things, right? But there's a couple things that you can look for that should help you with this, right? So uh, one of these photos is herbicide injury and one is a, is a bona fide disease. Which one is herbicide injury, top or bottom? Top. Top, yeah, why? What about it? Screen is... What's that? Down. Yep. Yep, right? Do you see how it's in a straight line? Yeah. Very, very straight line, right? So anytime, if you think about most things we do in home loans, we try to do it in a straight line, right? We mow, we fertilize, everything we do, it's usually in a straight line for the most part, right? So anytime you see damage in a straight line, go in the house, look in the mirror, right? <laughs> <laughs> and look at yourself, all right? You probably did something wrong. So yes, in case, up here, this is herbicide injury. And then the lower picture is large patch, right? The other thing that you may not have picked up on is the bottom picture is severely, that's a really bad case of large patch, but even in the middle of those patches, it may be hard to see, but you can still see green blades of grass, right? You see that? It's not complete total devastation of every single plant. Look at the herbicide injury. You have 100% death directly adjacent to 100% healthy, right? So anytime you see 100% dead up against 100% healthy, that should be a red flag that it's probably not a disease. There's one exception, and, and I'll show you that next with the spring dead spot, but most of the time, uh, that's not the case, all right? Here's another example. This is a spring dead spot. So one of these is spring dead spot uh, of Bermuda grass. The other one is herbicide injury on zoysia grass. Which one is the, the, the actual disease, left or right? Left. Uh-oh. We have two different ones. Yeah, this one's tricky. This one's hard. That's, that's why we're doing it, right? So the one on the right is the disease, right? The one on the left is Roundup injury. So uh, this person spot sprayed their zoysia while it was still dormant, uh, which we do not recommend. You can do that. Bermuda grass is tolerant. Of, you can clean up winter weeds and Bermuda grass while it's still brown uh, with Roundup. That's completely fine. But zoysia grass, you got to be careful with that. And that's what happened here. But look, there's a couple things that, that jump out to me when, when this photo was sent to me. Is one to see this T-shaped thing, and then look at the square. Do you see the square there? So you see those oddball shapes in there uh, that, that are like, yeah, I don't know about that. But you can see how this person thought that they had spring death spot. Spring death spot is a disease of zoysia grass, just like Bermuda grass, uh, but it was not. It was a ground up injury. Uh, most of the time, our, our diseases are, are going to be pretty uh, sporadic and uh, random in, the, in their distribution, uh, as, which is what you see here, right? Uh, another thing you'll learn about a lot of our diseases, it's not the case for every disease, but a lot of turf diseases are some size of a surf, some uh, version of a circle. They're either a tiny circle or a big circle. Uh, most fungi and turf, they start at a centralized point and they uh, spread out in a radial fashion. So you'll come to learn that there are different circles, rings, things like that uh, when you see the damage. All right, what about this? This is an example on the golf course putty green. Um, and, and there's these dead patches going across the green. Look at it a little bit closer. Does anybody think that's a disease? Based on everything I just told you? No. It's tricky, huh? But it is. All right. Very What's the other thing I told you about 100% dead next to 100% healthy? 100% dead. Yeah, which is yeah. there was an assumption that you're showing us soon. Well, yes. <laughs> that was the one spring death spot. Sorry. This is the exception where 100% dead beside 100% healthy. That's probably the only exception in turf where that happens, right? This is hydraulic leak. The, the mower that went across the green was leaking hot hydraulic fluid. <laughs> Everywhere the drops hit, right, killed the turf. So what this person did, this golf course superintendent, I don't think I would use push pins. That's probably not a good idea. 
but paint, right? Mark the edges. If it truly is a disease, it's going to continue to spread and it'll get bigger. So stick a flag in the ground or toothpick, whatever you want to do to mark it. Come back the next day and if it has progressed, even just a little bit beyond it, uh, you probably are dealing with, with some fungal uh, infection. All right? What about this? Is this a disease? This is a homeowner in eastern North Carolina. Uh, they thought they had a really bad case of large patch in their centipede grass. No, that looks like a... Uh, that looks like a... Uh, that looks like a... Somebody went along the edge and ran, ran around. You're, you're, you're pretty close. What else do you notice? I'm trying to get you to think outside some, the box. Some grass still growing. Some new grass still growing. You can't grow. You're beating all around it. <coughs> Look how clean that sidewalk is. Yeah. Uh, they pressure washed it with something with bleach. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. And it all ran down towards the driveway. That's crazy. Yep. Right? So this is a good photo, right? So when you go to help people out, right, and you come onto a lawn or a site, think outside the box, right? Look at the, look at everything, right? Another good one that you guys maybe think about is uh, newer homes that have the high uh, efficiency windows, glass. Have you ever seen in the news where they'll melt yes. car plastic? Yes, I never have. It'll do the same thing in the grass. You'll yep. see you'll see lines. It does it in my house. You'll see lines that follow pretty much the sun, right? And you'll see burn marks in the grass, right? Things like that, right? All kinds of crazy things that kill grass, all right? This is a golf course uh, uh, example, but once again, I, want you to, I don't want you to overlook one of the most important things when it comes to a home lawn. Does anybody want to guess what this may or may not be? This is a tough one. It is not a disease. It is not over fertilizing. Somebody said soil. Yep, soil. No, no. It's not mowing it too short. It's not over fertilizing. If you, if you didn't know, when it comes to golf course putting greens, they actually fertilize those very little. No, not driving golf course. That's a good, 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 good guess. It's actually just poor drainage. So um, all that is is just poor drainage. All right. So what I'm getting at is don't overlook the importance of good drainage. Right. Uh, how many home loans have you ever, or maybe even your own loan, where you see places that struggle because they stay wet for prolonged periods? Right. Uh, the, the plants are just literally choking out, right? Uh, if it's a real severe case, you'll get this what's called a black layer. Uh, so, you know, have a soil probe, a shovel, dig up a piece and look at it. <clears throat> if it's anaerobic, it'll stink. It'll smell like rotten eggs, a very sulfur-like smell. Uh, so don't overlook the soil. That's, that's what I'm getting at with that, right? Uh, and, you know, also soil testing for nutrients, things like that. That's, that's key when you're trying to troubleshoot some of these things, all right? Any questions about that? Everybody good? All right. So let's talk about the lab a little bit, just to show you what kind of samples we get. So this is a big part of what I do uh, at NC State. Um, uh, people send samples to us from all over the country, as you'll see here in a minute, but just show you what type of samples we get. All right, uh, just a little uh, background on the plant disease and insect clinic uh, at NC State. Uh, for those of you that are native to North Carolina, this is probably no surprise to you. Uh, the, the clinic was started in the 1950s in response to diseases of tobacco, right? Tobacco used to be king. Tobacco built this city, right? Pretty much. Big time. <laughs> so it, it drove the, the creation of the plant disease and insect clinic in the 1950s. Uh, I love this photo with the gentleman smoking a pipe in the lab. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are the days. It's, uh, I think it's Dr. Avery, who's an old professor. But another way to look at this that's interesting to me is uh, back then they had six full time faculty members that studied diseases of tobacco. Six professors, six doctors that studied diseases of tobacco. Uh, whereas now you have one and a half, I think, is the appointment. Uh, you know, we have one that's focused on, you know, it's pretty much one for each thing. And then even in some cases, some faculty members are, you know, studying multiple crops, right? They're not focusing on just one crop. Uh, so things have changed a lot. Uh, it did start out as a part-time thing only. It didn't take long for all the other commodities to be like, hey, what about me, right? Uh, so they, they made it a full-time thing. They added full-time staff. Insects were added in the, 70, in the 70s. Turf was added in the 70s with uh, Dr. L.T. Lucas. Uh, he was the first turf grass pathologist at NC State. Uh, so he handled that. And then in 2005, we formed what's formerly known as the Turf Diagnostic Lab, uh, which is what I was on. So now it's a, a separate thing from the plant disease and insect clinic, all right? Uh, just to show you where samples come from, it's not just the state of North Carolina. 
Uh, they do come from pretty much all over. Uh, the states in blue, uh, of the samples, 55% do come from North Carolina, the other 45 from out of the state. Uh, as you'll see here in a minute, uh, pretty much 100% of the samples that come from out of the state are exclusively, exclusively golf course putting greens, right? You'll see here in a minute that that is a big focus of our program. That's where the majority of the issues are, right? Uh, and you're, going to, you're probably wondering why that is, right? But think about, you probably don't know, but a golf course putting green, those plants are being loaded at a tenth of an inch or less, all right? That's 0 .100 inches, right? So you're mowing a tiny plant at 0 .100. You got people walking across it. You got golf balls coming in, all kinds of stuff. So that's a lot of stress on those grasses. So it sets them up to be susceptible uh, to, to disease issues, right? In general, the higher the cut of turf, uh, the less problems you have for the most part, all right? Because that plant's producing a, a deeper root system, it's able to photosynthesize more, things like that. It can fight off things a little bit better. Uh, right? All right. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, NC State is 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 known as uh, as a leader in, in, in as a turf grass school. Uh, we're one of the best programs in the nation, uh, you know, along with like Penn State. Uh, Penn State's a good program. Rutgers, uh, yeah. things like that. Right. Um, yeah, no, yeah, these, yeah, so the other thing is, you think about where, sure there. where uh, golf courses are too, right? Yeah. Uh, it should be no shock that we get a lot from the southeast, Texas, right. and California, right? Yeah. Uh, that's where a lot of the business comes from. Uh, we average about 425 submissions a year, uh, and a submission can be anywhere from two to four samples. Uh, if you actually count the number of turf grass plugs, it's somewhere between 900 and 1,000 uh, is what we see in a year. Uh, and I look at the majority of those. The only time I don't look at it is when I'm on vacation or whatever. Uh, and that's when Dr. Kearns covers. So we have one of our PhD students cover for me. Uh, but I do the majority of that um, uh, when those come in. All right. Uh, showing you the client distribution. Like I said, golf courses are number one. That's, that's who we work with the most. Uh, and that's who where I spend the majority of my time educating. Uh, and we educate folks all over the country uh, about golf course diseases uh, on, on golf, and primarily on golf course putting greens. Uh, you see homeowners at 10%, landscapers at 10%. Uh, you may be surprised to see ornamental grass nursery. Uh, that's one of those deals where we were getting uh, samples from, uh, and actually the majority of those come from Hoffman up in Rougemont, or Bahama, if any of you know them. Fantastic place. Uh, those samples were coming in, and we don't have an ornamental grass pathologist on staff at NC State. So these samples are coming in, you know, and everybody's looking around the room, and just because I do grasses, and that has the word grass in it. Right. <laughs> they got shut up to me, and I was like, okay. So we do ornamental grasses, and then you see sod farmer. What's one intersex? What's one segment of the industry that you do not see up there? It may surprise you a little bit. Think about turf grass, like high high. Fields. What's uh, it? Sports fields. Sports fields. Sports fields. Yeah. Exactly. Athletic fields. Now we do get samples from athletic fields. Uh, we won't get them from NFL, Major League Baseball, uh, Durham Bulls, uh, but they're pretty rare, right? Uh, most of the time, if you think about sports fields in the southeastern United States, most of them are planted in Bermuda grass, and Bermuda grass is a pretty tough, tough cookie, right? Uh, those of you probably really know that if you've ever tried to get it out of your tall patch or if you've ever had it as a weed. Uh, the diseases that they do get are pretty easy uh, uh, to identify, uh, and it doesn't require uh, the, the diagnostics lab to help them out. The other thing when you talk about sports turf is it's a pretty small acreage, right? A football field, a soccer field, a baseball field, especially when you talk about higher end turf. Uh, if it's that big of a deal and it's that damaged, they're just going to strip it up and re it, right? A uh, very, very common thing, uh, practice that, that, that those higher end fields do, all right? If you take away golf and, uh, and the uh, ornamental nursery, you can see the breakdown. It just happened to be in last year, it was an even split between homeowners and landscapers. And when I say a landscaper, that just means the landscaper is submitting it on behalf of a homeowner. Or it could be a commercial site, uh, it could be around a commercial property. Uh, then you see sod farms there at 10%, all right? Uh, of the host that come in, uh, you see the top two are creeping big grass, that's what bent is, and then you see Bermuda grass. Uh, pretty much 100, I'll say 99% of those two bars are from putting greens. All right, it's pretty rare that I get Bermuda grass on a home lawn um, or, or, or anywhere else. That's, that's pretty much all golf course putting greens. Uh, and then you get zoysia grass, ornamental grasses, tall fescue, or that's fescues all together. Centipede, poa is a, is a, is a so most people consider it a weed. Uh, it is a weed, poa annual bluegrass. Uh, it's, it's the one that's in a lot of people's lawns right now that's producing a tremendous amount of seed heads. Uh, it grows faster, so it's kind of ugly. 
but in certain climates, like in our mountains in western North Carolina, when you get to certain elevations, uh, you go up north and you go to California, it's actually cultivated uh, as a golf course putting green grass. Uh, it, it, you know, it's one of those things where it grows so good, you can't, you, you got to embrace it, right? You can't beat them, join them type thing. Uh, so they just, they, 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 they encourage it, right? Uh, and then you see other grasses. In other grasses, it's uh, things like St. Augustine grass, uh, which would be coastal uh, North Carolina. And, you know, as you go on down south towards Florida, all right? If we do just long, yeah. Why are so many golf courses switching their greens to that Bermuda Plum? What's the yep. advantage? That, that's, that's a good observation. Um, so th there has been a huge push. Uh, this helps explain it a little bit. Uh, you see those big bars in 10 and 11? Uh, I don't know if you remember, 2010 11 were pretty hot summers. They were pretty brutal. Uh, and it was really hard on full season grasses like creeping bent grass. Uh, breeders, uh, uh, turf grass breeders, uh, were coming out with improved varieties of uh, Bermuda grass that's known as an ultra dwarf Bermuda grass which is highly suited for a putting green height and conditions. So those varieties were coming out and then there was this huge shift in people uh, converting, right? Um, you know, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, we can grow both cool and warm season grasses here, but they, they each have their problems. Uh, but there has been a big shift in, in North Carolina. It's, it's, when you talk about the Piedmont to the coast, it, it's starting to become, it's gotta be right at 50%, if not more, 60% Bermuda, 40% bent grass, where people are converting to those grasses, right? And it, it, it's it's a club preference. It depends on their membership, when their golfers play, their budgets, things like that. They're both great grasses. It's, just, it's one of those things where you got to figure out which one's the best fit for you, right? Um, but there has been a big shift towards that. That's where a lot of people are planning, all right? Um, if you take away the golf stuff and just look at home lawns, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, Zoysia grass is number one. Uh, you would think tall fescue would be number one. If you think about the state of North Carolina, uh, mountains and Piedmont being uh, two thirds of the state, which is the majority tall fescue, if you will, uh, you would think we get a lot of that, but we don't. Uh, the diseases on tall fescue are fairly easy to diagnose on your own. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but zoysia grass, there's a lot of zoysia grass going in, just like with the golf course market. Uh, a lot of new neighborhoods, homeowners, um, you know, the cool season grasses can be tough to manage in the summer months here. Uh, and, and a lot of people like zoysia grass. Zoysia grass is nice. I, you know, I think it's a great grass as well. Uh, but it has its own set of issues as well in the, in the fall and the spring. Uh, and that's where those samples are coming from. So a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, what, what the diseases are. It's kind of a learning curve, if you will, where more and more of it's going in to big markets like Charlotte, Raleigh, Wilmington, things like that, right? especially in new construction. Uh, you also see a lot of Bermuda going in home homes uh, in, in new neighborhoods just now versus cool season grasses, all right? Um, but uh, I, I didn't show you the actual diseases that we diagnosed. I didn't want to get too deep into that. Um, uh, but a lot of them are, are what are known as soil-borne diseases. Uh, so that means they're attacking the roots and below ground parts. And it, you'll understand why that's an issue here in a minute, why those are so hard to control. Uh, so that's the majority of what we see. Uh, the diagnostics lab does serve as an alarm. It does allow us to, to track trends in diseases, where, when they're occurring, where they're occurring. Uh, which ones tend to be persistent and chronic. Uh, and from that, that drives a lot of our graduate students, the research that they do uh, based on that information. Uh, like I say, you know, we're getting thousands of samples in a year, so we have a lot of data we can go from. Uh, six, so 68% of, of graduate students study soil borne diseases that since the year 2000. Uh, myself included, when, when I did my master's degree, uh, I studied uh, soil borne disease, spring dead spot. Uh, majority of our fungicide field trials, our research trials that we do, are, are focused on those soil borne diseases as well. Uh, we do about 60 to 70 uh, research trials a year, and we do them all over the state. We do a lot of them. Have you ever been to, has any, have any of you ever been to field day at Lake Wheeler? Mm -hmm. So uh, every August, the second Wednesday of every August, we have a uh, turf grass field day. I highly recommend you come out if you want to learn more about turf. Uh, fantastic event. That's in Raleigh uh, off of Lake Wheeler Road, right there at the intersection of Lake Wheeler and Tryon. Uh, you can't miss it. Um, usually about eight, 900 people come, uh, so it's a big, big event. Uh, but you can learn a lot from there, right? Um, but that, we do a lot of research at that site, is what I'm getting at, but we also do a lot of research across the state. So we do stuff in the mountains, Piedmont Coast, uh, et cetera. Uh, most of it is, is focused on golf course uh, turf. Uh, like I said, that's where the majority of the real issues are. Uh, and that's a big part of what our, what our education focus is, all right? Any questions about that stuff?
Good? All right. So, what do you do when there's a problem, right? Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So, um, we do have a website. Imagine that, right? In 2019. Um, so, if you look us up on the web, you'll find us. NC State Turf Pathology. Uh, pretty easy to find. There shouldn't be another one in the world. Um, we do put uh, a lot of things up there. It is a blog, if you will. We do post, uh, you know, things we find interesting in our research or if there's something trending in a certain disease, uh, that'll be there as well. Uh, but it also has links to the Turf Diagnostics Lab. Uh, if you click on that, uh, there's videos there on how to take a sample, uh, there's paperwork to fill out, things like that. Uh, your local county agent can help you with that. Uh, and it's actually cheaper. So if you go to your local county agent, it's twenty dollars a sample. If you do it on your own, it's thirty dollars. So they try to encourage folks to go through their county extension office first, because uh, they may be able to help you, and you might not have to go through the trouble of, of doing all that. All right. Uh, so there's there's paper there and all that good stuff. So when you go to take a sample, right? Now, a lot of these examples are golf, but it, it all applies no matter what. The, 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 the concept's the same. Uh, what you're going to want to do is is when you got a damaged area. Right? You remember I told you fungi grow in a radial fashion? So what we want to do is when we take that sample, we want to cut it right on the outside edge of the damage. We want to have about half healthy, half damaged. Because if the fungus is if it's truly a disease, that's where it's going to be, right? So don't go, it's, it's very common for people to want to go right in the middle of the worst spot of the lawn and take a sample, right? The only thing I'm going to find is what I call buzzards, right? I'm just going to find a bunch of buzzard fungi. I want, I want the lions and tigers, right? I want the ones out on the edge that, that's, that they're spreading out, causing the damage. So about half healthy, half damaged. Uh, you don't have to go any deeper than the root system. Uh, some people like to send us you know, two foot of soil. Can't do anything with that. It's going to cost you a bunch of money in shipping. So shake all the excess dirt off and just send the root system. Uh, and, and you know, we usually say uh, in golf, it's a couple cup cutters, but for you guys, you know, you think about something about four inches square. You can do it with a pocket knife, you can do it with a shovel, however you want to get it up. Um, put about four inches square with it centered right over that, that, that leading edge of damage, all right? Um, you do that, right? Uh, right now, we're actually going to change this. Uh, right now, we tell folks to wrap them up like this uh, with aluminum foil to help hold the root zone intact, and it allows the foliage to breathe, if you will. Uh, but over the years, <laughs> over the years, we've gotten thousands of them like this, right? They look, it looks like some cheeseburgers or something. <laughs> Every time I see that, it makes me hungry. So um, <laughs> it's perfectly okay if you want to wrap it completely, right? There's nothing wrong with that, and, and it protects it in the shipping process. Uh, I mean, luckily, fortunate for you folks is that NC State's only 20 minutes, 30 minutes away, right? So you can drop it off in person. If you do ship it, be sure you wrap it up tight, right? Also, mark where they come from, right? And in this case, this is a golf course. They put number four, number seven, number 10. But if you want to put left side, right side, front yard, back yard, whatever, uh, the reason that is important is what if I find multiple things, right? What if I discover two different diseases, but then we've got a break in communication about exactly where those samples come from uh, on the property, right? So be sure you label them good. Uh, and you can write on the full just like that. Uh, try to keep uh, dirt off the foliage if possible. That hurts in our process. Uh, if you do ship them, just pack them tight, right? Newspaper, whatever you want to use. Uh, there is paperwork to fill out. Uh, this is something else that we're actually going to change in the, probably the coming year. Uh, we're going to go all online because it's pretty easy to do online. Uh, and I think it's easier than having to print off a sheet of paper, write it out, right? I, I think it's a lot easier just to go through and click boxes and select. Uh, so that's probably what we're going to switch to as far as the Turf Lab goes. But it's going to ask you these questions like, you know, obviously who you are, where you are. Uh, give us your email address. Uh, phone number uh, if you want us to contact you like that. Uh, you put the turf species, right? Uh, when it was planted, how it was planted, was it sod, was it seed, how old is it, how often does it get irrigated, what height are you mowing it at, things like that. And then it's going to ask you questions down here about what you're seeing, <coughs> right? Are you seeing circles? Are you seeing strips? Is it random? Is it uh, uh, isolated? Is it widespread? Is it in high areas, low areas, wet, dry, sunny, shady, things like that. Uh, those all help me uh, go down the path of deciding whether it truly is a disease or not, right? The good news is, is that just about everybody in here has a camera in their pocket these days, yep. right? Very easy to take a photo. So checking all those boxes are almost not even necessary anymore because you can send me a picture and show me exactly what it is you're seeing. Uh, and I highly encourage you that you do send photos if you submit samples and send a picture just like this, right? So just standing height, looking out across the lawn. In this case, this is large patch on zoysia grass. Uh, but very good, very good picture, a good way to illustrate. I can see the symptoms, I can see the patches, I can 
can see the distribution. You know, in this case, I can see that this is an open site. It's not boxed in by trees or fences or buildings and things like that. Uh, it helps me to get an idea for the environment that that grass is growing in uh, and the symptoms that are being expressed. So please send photos, it helps a lot. Usually close up pictures aren't all that useful. So a lot of people want to send pictures just looking straight down at the ground, right? And I always like to joke, and I'm not trying to be a smart ass here, right? But I have a microscope and I can look at it as close as I want with a microscope, right? So it doesn't help uh, usually when you're sending stuff like this, unless you're clearly trying to show me something like a, a mushroom or, or a fruiting body or something like that, then those are helpful, right? Sometimes you can just send photos and I can help you just by sending a photo, right? And I would encourage you to do that. Email me, shoot me a photo, say, hey Lee, I'm seeing this in, in a lawn. Do you think it might be a disease? If so, what it would be? You know, I, I may be able to tell you, yeah, that's, that, that looks like large batch. We're seeing a lot of that right now. Or, you know, I'm not sure, send a sample and we'll look at it on the microscope, all right? Everybody good with that? Yeah. A lot of information here. I gotta get a drink of water here for a second. All right, so uh, the, have any of you ever visited the plant disease and insect clinic? No. We were at the nematode lab. You went to the nematode lab? Yep. I did nematode. Yep. Have you guys ever want to visit? You're welcome to come. You just gotta let us know in advance, obviously. Don't be all 50 of you come bombarded in. Are you in the same place where, where they do the soil test? Different? No, this is different than soil testing. This is on campus at NC State. On the main campus? On the main campus, yeah, in Gardner Hall. Okay. Yep. All right, it's in the basement of Gardner Hall. Um, and this is where all the magic happens. This, this is all samples, it's not just turf, right? Uh, so you'll see all kinds of stuff in here, right? What the zealous, the zoysia, whatever an A to Z would be. Um, uh, everything comes through there, and that's where we currently do turf diagnostics. We're actually moving our lab to Centennial Campus, but that doesn't matter for now. But this is where it all happens. So, it's, and people wonder, what, what do you do with those, those samples when you get them? What exactly happens? Uh, so, just to show you what we do, it, it is pretty straightforward. Uh, obviously, they arrive, uh, and then you'll see on the paperwork it says, "Do not put in a plastic bag," right? <laughs> and then they put them in plastic. What did bags. I do? I put it in a plastic bag, right? There's a big difference from me putting it in a plastic bag versus it being in a plastic bag on the back of a UPS truck for a couple of days, right? Big difference. Uh, why do we put it in a plastic bag? It doesn't spread contamination. Remember what the fungi love? Yeah. Have you ever left a sandwich in a Ziploc bag too long? Or anything, right? You get mold, right? It's a fungus, right? It explodes in there. So we put it in a plastic bag and that's all it's doing is getting the humidity up. Uh, it is at room temperature, uh, and typically if it truly is a fungal disease, within about 24 to 48 hours, it is going to flourish in that sample in, in a plastic bag like that, and then we can put it under a microscope and, and identify, right? So that's why we do that. We put them in plastic bags, call them incubation chambers, that's the fancy word, or it's just a plastic bag, right? Uh, we use two different types of microscopes, if you will. Uh, the one is a dissecting scope or a stereoscope, and all this is is basically just a hand lens, a fancy hand lens, right? This, what I see through this thing is what you could see if you had a magnifying glass or, or, or a loop, like a jeweler's loop. Very, very similar, just easier to use. And then you have your traditional microscope, you know, where you can look at things from whatever, 200 to, to 1,000 X uh, to, to identify them closer. But I'll show you what, the, what that looks like. Uh, so the first thing we do is we look under the dissecting scope or the stereoscope, and this is what it looks like when we look at it, right? Hmm. Uh, and just at this first stage of looking at a turf graph sample, we can tell a lot of things, believe it or not. Uh, about whether this may or may not be a disease. Uh, one thing that, that we can tell right away is that it's probably not a foliar disease, right? And the reason I know that is, is I don't see any lesions, I don't see any leaf spots, I don't see any fungal growth, I don't see any fruiting bodies, I don't see anything, right? If you actually, if you look, at, if you don't know much about turf grass, then the new leaf comes out of the middle, out of the world, and you can see these new leaves are popping out. They actually haven't even, haven't even fold, unfolded yet. They're still folded up. You can see all the new foliage looks perfectly fine, but if you, if you go on down the architecture of the plant there, right, you can see all their older leaves are turning yellow and senescing faster than normal. Uh, usually that's a red flag for a root problem. So it means something's going on in the soil, whether it be a disease, a uh, nutrition issue, whatever. Uh, there's something going on below ground in this sample. Have, you know, right there, right away, we can say this is not a foliar disease because uh, we don't see anything, right? Uh, sometimes you'll see things like algae. This is what algae looks like up close. It looks like these little slimy black green threads, if you will, uh, growing all over the leaf blades. Uh, and, and then there are times when you actually see the fungus, right? This is anthracnose. This is a common uh, fungus that attacks turf. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, fruiting body. 
Um, these are called uh, just a serviola. The, 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 that kind of milky white stuff is the spores in there. Did and, you see anthracnose? Anthracnose. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you can see that at that stage. You can see that with the handling, right? That's something you can diagnose on your own just by looking at that. All right. Sometimes you'll see things like this with our warm season grasses in the spring of the year. They green up. So as you all know, it's not uncommon in February for us to have a 70 degree day or an 80 degree day, whatever. In March as well, and warm season grasses might green up a little bit. And then we have some cold nights, and then all of a sudden the warm season grasses look splotchy and funky, right? Uh, it's just cold weather injury. You'll see this leaf purpling. Those are the tips of the leaves will turn purple. Um, and it's just, just a cold injury from that new tissue, right? What about this one? This is this is current and relevant. See this all the time on turf grass samples right now. And if you were to look at one real close with a hand lens, you'd see it too. Is that a fungus? Pollen. Pollen, pollen. exactly. <laughs> right? All right. And so some people do look at that and think it's fungal spores or something all over their turf. But what's the other thing you notice about the turf grass plant? If that were truly a fungal disease and it was producing that much material, it looks pretty. It looks pretty healthy. Exactly, it's very healthy. Yeah, it looks, good, it looks right? robust. Yes, it looks very healthy. That's the other thing to pay attention to is when things look. You know, if it looks healthy, you don't see any dying leaves or lesion or rotting. Uh, that should be a cue to you that it's probably not. It's harmless, right? Uh, you'll see that with slime molds. Slime molds are very common in home lawns. Uh, that if any of you ever remember the, the, the candy nerds, uh, like pink and purple nerds, that's what slime mold looks like. Looks like somebody sprinkled nerds on your lawn. Uh, but, but you'll notice that it does not damage the plant whatsoever. All right. Um, the other one, I don't know if I have it in this slide set, but the other one is spider webs. Uh, you'll see spider webs in a home lawn, and people think it's fungal growth. They'll think it's mycelium from fungi. Once again, step back, look at the lawn. If it's nice and green and very healthy, if it were truly a fungus and it was producing that much material that you could see it, and some fungi do, um, it would be damaged, right? There'd be brown patches, dead areas, things like that. Um, sometimes I get samples in like this. <coughs> Does anybody know what this is on the, on the turf grass leaf lake? Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, this one might be tricky. This, this is actually a fungicide. So, my point here is if you know you're going to send samples, and you think you're going to treat with a fungicide, take your sample before you spray the fungicide. All right? Fungicides work really, really well. So if you spray it with a fungicide and you send it to me, you know, don't be surprised when I say, I can't find anything. You've, you've, you've controlled it. Hey, what, was, what were the webs? Were they mites? Were they spiders? Spiders. Or they were some, yeah. some kind of property? I've got, I, I don't, I don't think it's in this slide deck, uh, but I do have a picture of a home lawn with spider webs all over it. Um, and you know, they're about that big. The other thing is if you look close enough, you, sometimes you actually see the spider, or it'll be like a funnel web, you'll, you'll see the funnel, things like that. Um, so after that, we cut the samples in half, and I look at your soil profile just to see what's going on. This is a golf sample, but same thing. This person had this particular golf course has what's called a layering issue. Uh, they're, they're not uh, top dressing with sand on a frequent enough basis, and you get layers. It kind of looks like a, a chocolate cake. <laughs> So it always makes me hungry, once again. Uh, you can see where they've actually aerified, so they, they, they you know, yep. remove a core and backfill it with sand, so they're trying to correct it. So that's things we look at. Uh, that's another one you can see where they've been aerifying, they've been punching holes, putting sand back, things like that, all right? So we wash all the sand, uh, soil away so I can look at the root zone, look at the health of the roots. Uh, and then we look a little bit closer at the stolons. In this case, this is a Bermuda grass plant with a stolon. Yeah. Once again, still under the stereoscope. You can see this with a hand lens, right? Not, not a high-powered uh, microscope. Uh, this is spring dead spot. Uh, for any of you that, that have uh, Bermuda grass or zoysia grass, and you've got these white-looking circular patches of dead grass, uh, if you haven't seen it, now that I've told you and you start looking for it, you'll see it everywhere. Very, very common disease in the spring of the year on, on Bermuda and zoysia. Uh, but it produces this mycelial plaque. Uh, that's just the survival structure for the fungus through the winter. It actually infects the plant back in the fall, and it sets it up for injury from cold weather, um, and then you see the results of that when it greens back up in the spring. Those patches of grass, they don't survive the winter, so they die in little circles, all right? Um, back to that sample where the older leaves were dying off, this is pulling out one individual plant. Same thing, just looking under that same scope. You can see the old leaves look rough, but the new foliage looks good. Uh, and then we look down into the crown of that plant, you can see it, it's necrotic, right? And in this case, that's a fungus in there. Uh, in this case, it's called summer patch, is the particular disease of, of this uh, plant here, but it's infecting the crown. That, that's that's uh, you know that's uh, central station for a turf grass plant. That's where all the growth comes from. 
So when you have something in the crown of a turf grass plant, that's bad news, right? That plant's going to die. Um, uh, so that's, that's not good in that case. Once again, you can see that uh, without anything fancy, all right? Uh, the same disease when you wash the soil away from the roots, you can see uh, a lot of our fungi go right for the xylem and phloem, right? So the vascular cylinder of the root, right? That's where all the goodies are. That's where the food and water is going back and forth. Uh, and that's what the fungus wants. Uh, so you can see in this case that fungus is in there and it's causing necrosis right in the vascular cylinder or the middle of that root, if you will. Um, looks like a shrimp. That reminds me of, you know, if you look in the back, back side of a shrimp, right? Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what that looks like, right? Go. So once again, this, these are things that you can do on your own, right? You can pull plants out, you can wash the soil away, look at it, and you can see that the vascular cylinders are rotting out, things like that, and it may help you out with, with the diagnostics. Uh, the next stage is to, is to go to the microscope, right? And this is to look at it a lot closer, um, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 X. Most of the time, we operate anywhere between 200 and 600 X. Uh, that's usually plenty of magnification for what we're looking at. Uh, but this is back to that, that dark uh, vascular cylinder, if you will, the one I just showed you. This is what it looks like when you look at it at 200 X. Uh, you can see the vascular cylinder is necrotic. And then you can actually see the fungus itself. It's those black, uh, sorry, brown strands there. Uh, that's the hyphae, that's the body of the fungus. So if there was no fungus there, would that, that brown root not be there? It would not be there. Okay. That's correct. Yep, exactly. Uh, good, good observation, yep. Uh, so there are things about all fungi that produce distinct morphological features that allow us to identify them. Uh, and you know, so it's, 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 a, it's a process, right? You have to go by the symptoms that, you have to go by the time of the year, the symptoms you're observing, and then the things you, that you look at when you look at closer. It all has to match up, right? Because there are a lot of fungi and bacteria in, in the soil, right? It's in the billions, billions, whatever. It's, it's crazy how much, how many microbes are in our soils, right? Uh, so you see that. Uh, another, another example, this is Pythium root rot. Uh, it, it produces, looks like little fried eggs uh, on the vascular cylinder. Uh, once again, very key morphological feature that allows us to say, yes, that's a Pythium species. Uh, this is what the hyphae, so the fungus, the body of the fungus itself, when you look at it up close, this is Pythium. Uh, in this case, uh, it produces this grainy mycelium, uh, that our hyphae that allows us to identify. You know, when, when you see things fuzzed up on plants, you see that cotton candy looking stuff, this is what it looks like when you look at it uh, up close under a microscope. Uh, a lot of our fungi produce spores, so spores are like seeds to a fungus, if you will. Uh, in this case, this is in Dragnose, that form, the little black spiny things. It produces these banana shaped, you know, they look just like bananas. Uh, and then it has a little drop of oil right in the middle. You may see that or may not see that. Looks like a little drop of oil right in the middle of that. Very distinct character for that fungus, which allows us to say, yes, this is anthracnose beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, will it allow us to identify the fungus to a species? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, we have to do uh, DNA work for that, right? Uh, and that's a question we get a lot as well is, do you culture it out or do you do DNA work, right? Uh, for diagnostics, for day-to-day -day diagnostics, we do not do that. It takes too long. Uh, you know, by the time you isolate a fungus into pure culture, it can take you a week. Uh, and then by the time you extract the DNA uh, and then uh, submit it for sequencing to get, you know, you're looking at a two to three week time period uh, at best to get that information back. Now, on the research side of things, we do this all the time. We do this very, very frequently, right? Uh, we store about 8,000 uh, cultures of fungi uh, in, in, our, in, free, in uh, cold storage. Uh, so we do, we work a lot with those. Uh, we've identified them all. That's a lot to do with graduate student projects and things like that, uh, which leads me to another point. This is a very, another very common question is, uh, when we have cold winters, right? A very common question I get is, we just had a very cold winter. Will the diseases be less severe this year, right? So, just to give you a little information, I just told you we store around 8,000 fungal isolates in uh, a freezer. We keep that freezer at 112 degrees below zero, all right? So we store fungi at 112 degrees below zero <clears throat> for years, right? I can take that fungus out of that freezer and within two or three days it starts growing again, right? So a couple of nights in the teens or, you know, <laughs> the whole winter. What's, what, what's that gel looking at? Uh, on the left? On the right. On the right, that, yeah, that's just a, uh, a PCR. That's a C, uh, where we uh, use primers to identify a particular species, yeah. So that's, okay. that's an image of the gel, yeah. Yep. That's, that's DNA stuff, yeah. Is that Fahrenheit or is that a uh, That is Fahrenheit, yeah, 112 below. Yeah, so it's uh, 80 in centigrade. Yeah, we call it minus 80, but 112 below zero. Yep. 
Yeah, and so that's what it looks like when you do a, a, a PCR gel uh, for, for DNA identification. And then those are just ladders on the side that help you yeah. determine the size. All right. All right, so when it's all said and done, you submit a sample within, usually within a couple days, one to two days, depending on how busy we are and whether or not it needs longer incubation. Um, uh, you'll get a report like this. Uh, in this case, this is from a golf course in, uh, this is in Cary, if you know Prestonwood Country Club. Uh, it has three golf courses there. <clears throat> in this case, they had two different diseases. So on uh, the Meadows course, number eight, they had Pythium root rot. And then on number eight, Highlands, it was Summer Patch. So it just says, hey, we found these diseases. For more information, go here, and it just gives you a link to turf files. Did Grady talk about turf files, or are you guys familiar with turf files? Yes. Perfect. So we have the most common diseases on turf files. Uh, and it, you can go there, and it'll be photos. It'll describe it. Uh, it you know, it'll, most of the time, when you go to that and you read it, and you're like, Yep, yep, that's just what's, what's, what happened. It all matches up, right? The other thing that's great about turf files that's different from the book you have, this book here, this book is a fantastic resource. And every year, uh, in late fall, early winter, I go through every fungicide label uh, and for turf, and I make sure the information is correct, and then I add new products to this book, right? So all this is, is oh, it's a fun job. Um, so all this is, is this is just a translation of the label to the book. So this just shows you that yes, it is labeled for it, and then these are the rates. But it doesn't tell you nothing about whether that fungicide is good or not. All right? <laughs> if you didn't know, just because a fungicide, just because a fungicide is labeled for a certain disease, does not mean that it's very good for that particular disease. One of the best examples is a lot of the products you find in big box stores, I won't name them, a lot of the big box stores, the active ingredients, the fungicides that they have on the shelves for things like brown patch and tall patch are actually terrible active ingredients, right? So this is where turf files comes in handy, right? When you go to turf files on the disease page and you scroll down to the bottom, it lists everything you have in your book, but we also rate it uh, on a scale from one to four. And this is based off our field research, right? So everything we do in the field, uh, we also compare notes with Clemson, Tennessee, Virginia Tech, uh, Georgia, our surrounding schools that have turf programs, we all compare notes. Uh, we all attend the same scientific meetings. Uh, so it's based off you know, the current field research. And the reason we put it online and not in the book because we don't want that to be permanent, right? It's, 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 it constantly changes, right? We're adding new products, new research and data comes in, so things adjust accordingly. So when you look at a product, it'll be on a scale from one to four, there are little plus symbols. If it, you pretty much want to choose products that have a three or a four plus symbol, right? That means they're really good. For that particular fungus, uh, anything that's a one or a two or has a question mark, you probably don't want to mess with. All right, Does everybody got that? Yep. Chemical companies love this word, man. Would you give a, Would you give my product a two for? Sucks. Sorry. Yeah. Right. That's our job is to protect the end user, right? To give you correct information. So we do have a little friction with them when it comes to that, but we have data to back it up. That's why we love science, right? Factual. All right. That's a whole another show there, but um, what about a fungicide? So let's talk about using fungicides, right? Uh, just a little bit of background. <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of things you can do to prevent diseases, right? You can plant uh, varieties that are not as susceptible. Uh, there really are no turf grass varieties that are completely resistant to, to those diseases, right? But you can have varieties that are more uh, tolerant or, or less susceptible, if you will, all right? Um, if you find yourself in this in a high profile situation and you do want to use a fungicide, there's a couple key concepts you need to understand. And the first one that's probably the most important is how fungicides work, right? If you think about the term fungicide, literally it does mean a fungus killer, fung fung fungicide, right? Uh, but fungicides do not kill fungi, they only put them on pause. That's why I have the stop sign there, right? Uh, if anybody has ever tried to treat something like brown patch and tall pesky, right? You make a fungicide application on June 1st. And then on July 1st, what happens if you don't reapply? It comes right back, right? You've only suppressed it for three to four weeks. As soon as that fungicide wears off and breaks down in the environment, that fungus is gonna resume growth, right? So it's not like a herbicide where you spray for weeds, you kill that weed, right? You know, and the only way it comes back is if another seed blows in uh, or, or if it regenerates from, from some below ground structure. Uh, but you're not really killing the fungus. Now, when the fungicide does come into contact with those lean uh, growing cells, it will kill the individual cells. Uh, but fungi are pretty slick. They'll shut things down. It's not like they suck it all the way into their entire body. Those first few cells will die, but they'll just stop. You know, they'll just like, okay, I'm stopping for now. You know, they're not going to grow anymore. 
Um, and then they'll resume as soon as, as soon as conditions are favorable, all right? So that's a very, very important concept, right? I run into this a lot with homeowners. You know, they, they, they pay for a lawn care service to come in and treat for a disease. Uh, they expect it to be a one and done thing and I'll never see it again, and, and that's not the case, all right? We think about fungicides in the grand scheme of things, right? We talk about all of agriculture. Where do we sit, right? Uh, this little pie chart, this is from 95, but it's still pretty accurate. Uh, if you look at the big markets for fungicides, it's uh, orchard crops, uh, grapes, nuts, vegetables, uh, and grains, right? And then you see turf grass is that tiny little orange slice of the pie, right? We are a very, very small player in the fungicide market. You know, when it, when it comes to pest control and, and, and turf, and, and particularly in home lawns, what, what, what are people most worried about when it comes to insects, weeds, and diseases of those three? Weeds. weeds, exactly. Weeds are by a long shot, number one, right? <clears throat> Diseases and insects are pretty low on the, on, the, on the ladder there when it comes to that. But turf and all, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about everybody, golf, athletic fields, everybody, right? When I talk about turf in this situation. Uh, but the other thing about this is if you're an ag chemical company and you're going to invest millions in creating a new uh, fungicide, what are you going to focus on? If you own the chemical company, are you going to spend millions on turf? No. no. You're going to focus on agriculture, right? And that's how it works. They put all their research and efforts into agriculture, and then we get them as a secondary. They're like, oh, well, let us have that to play with it, right? So it makes its way down to turf after the fact. It's, it's extremely rare that a company from the get-go develops an active ingredient just for turf, right? Uh, so we're getting a lot of times when we get active ingredients, it's already been used in, in some other crop, all right? Um, and a lot of them are designed to work. And, and, and you can think about it, right? If you're, if you're designing a fungicide for soybeans, and if you've ever seen a soybean field, you know, you've got plants, whatever, this tall, very dense canopy, right? That's a whole different system when it comes to applying that fungicide versus turf grass that's this tall, right? Uh, those fungicides have things that help them move through the leaf, uh, the way they move in the plant, things like that. Uh, the good news is we understand it very well, all right? The other thing is the safety of turf grass, like our fungicides as a whole. I just have turf, but it is fungicides as a whole, right? Uh, this is a very important concept to understand, right? In the grand scheme of things, fungicides are pretty safe products, right? Uh, when you talk about insecticides, on the other hand, those are kind of nasty, right? Especially some of the older ones. Uh, think about something like aldicarb, right? Uh, acting on a central nervous system of an insect. We have central nervous systems as well, so a lot of those insecticides, the way they act on the insect, they also act on us, which makes them very toxic to us, right? Uh, but just to give you some examples, does anybody know what, uh, so just to set it up, uh, probably helps if I explain what in the world LD50 is. Anybody know what that is? It's the route in which 50% of a given sample set will die. Exactly, right. So if everybody in this room were to eat, uh, you know, it's milligram per kilogram of your respective body weights. So whatever you weigh, you would eat one milligram per kilogram of your body weight. If we were all to eat one of these things, 50% of us would die, right? That's the idea of oral LD50. So it gives you an idea of toxicity, right? You have to remember when it comes to toxicology or toxicity, uh, it's the dose that makes the poison. So it's how much you're exposed to uh, and, and, and that, that determines the, the level, right? But still, this gives you a good idea of how toxic something is, if you will, right? Uh, does anybody know what botulinum toxin is? Yes. No? It's a bacterial. It's Right, so this is a, one of the most common bacteria we find in our soil. Very, very common, right? It's what they use in Botox, right? People shoot this in their face, right? <laughs> For wrinkles and whatnot. It works, right? It's killing those nerve cells or whatever to make them relax, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But very, very toxic. One of the most toxic substances out there, and it's natural, right? It's a natural <coughs> thing, right? That's the other thing. We we'll, won't we'll go down that road, but that right. Right. <laughs> Botox. So that's point zero 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 three, right? Is the oral LD50. All right. And insecticide, aldicar, very nasty product. This is going to be one of those things that has a skull and crossbones on it. Uh, you know, one. What's that? Oh, I thought somebody said something. Sorry. All right. And then look at some other some other things, right? Nicotine, fifty. Caffeine, two fifty. <laughs> Another insecticide, ibuprofen or Advil. Table salt, three thousand. Chlorothalonil, which is a fungicide, alcohol, 7,000, tritomethone, which is a fungicide, 10,000, right? 
everybody get the idea? I'm not suggesting that you mix these in your drink or <laughs> roll them up and smoke them, none of that, right? <laughs> Still want to handle them with care, right? Wear protective equipment. But in the grand scheme of things, they're pretty simple. And I love showing this to college kids, right? Because, <laughs> you know, I do teach at NC State. And I say, you know, over the course of a weekend, you go out, you, you kids are going to have a bunch of alcohol. You're probably going to eat salty food, which is going to make you drink some more alcohol. And, you know, you may have some nicotine. Uh, you're going to wake up in the morning, you're going to have some caffeine, you're probably going to have some ibuprofen. Right? <laughs> so in the course of a weekend, you've done far more damage to your body than you're probably ever going to do with, with these products. Right? <laughs> All right. So in general, we're pretty safe. You know, the other thing, too, is think about fungicides. We use them on ourselves, right, for things like athlete's foot. Uh, you know, humans do get uh, fungal infections, and, and a lot of the creams and things that we use for those infections uh, or our fungicides. They're very, very similar to the exact same active ingredients that we use in, in crop and plants, all right? Uh, the other thing to understand is how fungicides move in the plant, right? So when you apply that fungicide to the plant, what happens? Does it soak in? Does it slide off? Does the plant eat it? Well, you know, what happens? Uh, and, and there's a lot of different, there's several different scenarios. Uh, the first being what's known as a contact fungicide. So think of that as like paint. Uh, so you put the fungicide on the leaf and it just sticks to it and that's it, right? Uh, most of our contact fungicides are not labeled for home lawn use. They're, they're for higher end professional use. Uh, is where you see those. <clears throat> the biggest issues with those are is that if you apply a contact fungicide to a turf grass plant, you paint that leaf blade. What do we do to turf grass plants on a weekly basis? Uh, mow it, right? So if you apply a contact fungicide on the leaf that's this big, right, and then it mows like this, you're going to mow it off. Mows like that, and you're, you're just constantly shaving that fungicide off every time you mow. So they're very short lived, <clears throat> all right? Very good for knockback, like a quick knockback, but short lived. Then you have what's known as localized penetrants. These are the things that just soak into the leaf blade. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot like taking a paper towel and putting it on a, you know, a, a spill on the counter, if you will. It just kind of soaks into it. The plant does not pull the fungicide into the vascular cylinder, it doesn't send it to the leaf tip, it doesn't send it to the roots. It just kind of soaks in. <clears throat> that technology is really good, like I said, for, for row crops where you have these big bushy plants and you're hitting the tops of the plants and you want it to soak through to the bottom side of the leaf, all right? <clears throat> the majority of the fungicides we use are what's known as systemic. Uh, so this means that they do move around in the plant. Um, and the majority of those and all of the ones that you guys will ever use move upward only, all right? There's only one class of fungicides that move truly move down, that's the phosphites. Uh, and most of those are labeled for professional use on and professional turf, all right? Uh, and that's known as the true systemic. So the majority of what you use is going to be upward only, all right? Does anybody want to guess why that matters? So if you apply a fungicide to a plant, right, and it hits the leaf blade and it moves to the leaf tip only, what if you're trying to treat for a root disease? Is it going to work? Uh, <laughs> that's where we see failures a lot, right? People don't understand this, this concept of how they move in the plant, right? So what's something you might be able to do to put that fungicide on target? <clears throat> you think about it, like if I, if I spray a fungicide on the lawn and I want it to reach the root system, do I stomp it, do I stomp it in or what do I do? Water. Water, Water. irrigation, right? Uh, and that's provided you have an irrigation system <coughs> to help push it down through the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an option. The other option is that you can put it out a higher carrier volume. So you put the same amount of fungicide, but you're putting it out with two to three, four times as much water to help wash it in or drench it in, all right? <clears throat> and I got some, you know, some good examples here to show you, all right? So this is wheat. This is just a really good picture to illustrate this very, very well. Uh, it's got powdery mildew on these wheat leaves. Uh, you can see the top leaf is untreated with a fungicide, and you can see the, the powdery mildew has completely wiped it out, right? And then focus on number three here. This is a Zoxystrobin or Heritage. Heritage is a very common fungicide that people like to use in home lawns for brown patch. It is an acropolal penetrant, meaning, meaning that it moves upward only, all right? So you can see that it was inoculated with a powdery mildew. I mean, then you see it inside the two sharpening marks there, you can see like little faint white dots. So they went in with a dropper and they applied the fungicide, right? And you can see the plant pulled that fungicide out to the leaf tip and provided 100% control. But look right there on the line. None of it went backwards towards the root system. Does everybody can see that, yeah. right? And, we, and then these two down here, these are localized penetrants. These are the ones that kind of soak in. Right, you can see that there that they did soak in a little bit left and right of those marks, but it didn't go to the leaf tip and it did not go to the root. Right, uh, so once again, majority of what you use is example three that moves upward only. All right, so it's, it's crucial to understand the diseases that you're controlling. Right, so if you're controlling a foliar disease like brown patch, pythium blight, gray leaf spot, and, and tall fescue, 
You can get away with one to two gallons of water per thousand as a carrier volume and perfectly fine. If you're treating a root disease, you gotta bump that up to five gallons or more per thousand square feet or you gotta water it in uh, with irrigation. All right, so this has been a really big focus of our research program over the past few years, looking at environmental fate, what happens with these fungicides when we apply them, where do they go. Uh, just to give you the real short, quick version is, is that they're almost impossible to push through the tax layer. They bind so tightly, tightly to organic matter that it's really, really hard to get them down to the root system, which goes back and explains why a lot of the problems we see in the clinic, remember, are soil-borne diseases. All those root diseases are one of those, those are the most difficult to control because it, it's, it, you have a really hard time getting the fungicide on target. <clears throat> most foliar diseases are pretty easy to control because we can, we can reach the target, all right? So when you apply a fungicide, just imagine there's a little fungicide droplets, right? And they're going to go upward only, and nothing's going to make it down to the root zone unless, unless we water it in. Won't go over this in too much detail, but just most of our fungicides have a very high, what's known as a KOC value, means they bind very tightly to organic matter, uh, which we have a lot of organic matter in turf grass systems, especially in the tax layer, uh, when you think about that, all right? So we did a lot of different research, but I think this one explains it the best. Uh, we grew some creeping big grass in these little cones, um, and we inoculated it with a fungus. In this case, it was summer patch. Uh, you know, we confirmed that the fungus is indeed there, all that good stuff. Uh, we apply a particular fungicide, and we looked at different irrigation amounts, right? So this is a root disease with fungicide that moves upward only. <clears throat> if you look at the left side, uninoculated means no fungus, so everything looks perfectly fine. And then inoculated is the side where we put the fungus in there with the plant, right? So a root, root fungus, you can see zero inches, a tenth, an eighth, and a quarter, right? So as those irrigation amounts went up, we got much better control, right? Does everybody see that? Yeah. So very, very good illustration of when we're trying to control root, root diseases, soil-borne diseases, that so we gotta push that fungicide into the soil or it's gonna fail 100% of the time, right? So a good example for you guys would be uh, something like spring dead spot. Uh, large patch is one that's a little bit deeper in the profile. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail uh, here in a second, all right? Uh, so now, getting more into the frequently asked questions part, is one of the more common questions I get is, do granular fungicides work, right? There are granular fungicide options out there for turf versus liquid spraying them. Granular is easier to apply. You don't have a sprayer or any kind of specialized equipment. You can just put it in the same sprayer you spray fertilizer. And the answer to that is yes and no. So this is actually a slide from one of my colleagues at the University of Missouri, but we've observed the same things through the years. It's the exact same results, right? There are two products that work very well. It's Heritage and Headway. Uh, they are both available to anybody. You can order it on Amazon. Be here in two days, right? Things like that. <clears throat> uh, but those granular fungicides work very well. Uh, there are other ones out there that don't work so well, like this arm, right? The, the liquid version is fantastic, but the granular version is not. It has a lot to do uh, with the way they make it, the size of the creel, and the way they carry that active ingredient uh, on there. But uh, Heritage and Headway are the only two we ever really recommend uh, if people are going to do that, all right? Uh, the other question we get a lot is, I just applied a fungicide to my lawn and it poured down rain, right? Uh, if you think about brown patch, this is brown patch and tall fescue. Uh, especially with landscape companies, they're out making applications all day long and inevitably in the summer months you're going to get some thunderstorms at 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right? So this is a situation where uh, we apply the fungicide and then we simulated a half inch rainfall event uh, 15 minutes after application. So we apply our fungicides, 15 minutes later we simulate a big rainfall event and then what you're looking at is 28 days later. So in, in, in tall fescue with brown patch we expect products to last a month. Uh, and you can see it did not affect them. So the control, the non-treated control, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of disease, but all the fungicides that are commonly used uh, work very, very well. Even the granular, the Heritage G, the granular version uh, was, was, was uh, acceptable as well. So, uh, you know, if anything, the rain may have actually helped because it pushed it down a little deeper. It doesn't matter, the plant's gonna pull it right back up to the top uh, and give you excellent control. Um, and then another question we get is, what about organic control? Uh, over the years, we have uh, tested uh, a lot of uh, bio fungicides, if you will, and they have all failed miserably. They just do not work, all right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, but one product that has shown some promise is actually from a company here in RPP called Ag Biome. Uh, they've got this, uh, it's, a, it's a secondary metabolite of a bacteria is what they're using. Uh, it's called Zeo is the trade name. Uh, we originally tested it on golf course putting greens, uh, and I think the photo probably shows the best. Uh, and then we put it up against the industry standard Heritage, uh, which is an excellent product for brown patch. 
Uh, and at the high rate, it worked pretty well. It worked as good as heritage, right? You can see the, you can see the disease, the little circles in there, the brown patch. So at the lower rates, this, this Zeo product was not working, but at the high label rate, uh, every 14 days, it did a phenomenal job, you know, as good as heritage. And that was exciting for us, right? It's the first time in my career I've ever seen one of these products actually stand the chance. So the next step is, let's try it on top SKU, because uh, there may be a good fit for that in home lawns that want to build on an organic program, right? Uh, we tested it in top SKU and it failed miserably. <laughs> it didn't work, right? One of the problems we think, this is just from last year, so one of the problems, even though that says 2019, it should say 18, we're not in the future, but uh, the company wanted us to tank mix it with a wetting agent. So a wetting agent is like a soap, if you will. Uh, we think that it caused it to sheet off the leaf blade, uh, and that may have actually hurt the product. So uh, this year we'll probably look at it without a wetting agent, uh, and hopefully it, it, it shows some promise, all right? Uh, any questions about any of that before we go into specific diseases real quick? Yep. Yes, so that's a great question. So uh, there is, <clears throat> it's called fungicide resistance. Um, there are certain fungi that are known and well documented to be resistant to certain chemical classes. The good news for you guys is that there's really no diseases and hormones that we have to worry about in this area. So you think about brown patch and tall fescue, it has never been documented to be resistant to anything. And that's why we can get away with doing repeated applications of the same fungicide, right? Uh, you take something like dollar spot, which is a very common disease uh, on high-end dirt. Um, it, 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 it does develop resistance to certain chemical classes. So those turf grass managers are aware of that. And they just have to rotate through different chemical classes to help uh, you know, to mitigate that or slow it down or, or prevent it, right? Uh, it is a thing. And all that is is selection pressure. It's not, it's not that you're creating this uh, mutant fungus. Uh, you know, fungi are just like us. It's a population of people, right? Uh, if we come across with a certain fungicide and spray us, you know, it may kill whatever 95% of us, and there's five of us in that fungal population that persist. Uh, you know, obviously, they breed and reproduce, right? And then the next thing, you, you keep removing everybody else but that member of the population. That member of the population keeps growing and growing and growing. And the next thing you know, the entire population is that particular strain of that fungus, uh, and that's where you get resistance, right? The chemical no longer works. Uh, so that, that, that does happen. But fortunately, we don't have to deal with that. That's, that's primarily an issue that you see, and uh, golf course managers have to be real cognizant of that with uh, anthracnose, dollar spot, uh, and, and certain pithies. All right? It's a great question. <clears throat> Anything else? All right, specific diseases. All right, brown patch, by far the most common disease you're going to see in home loans uh, and tall fescue. It's guaranteed to happen each and every year. If you've got tall fescue, you've seen it, uh, it's a good chance. Uh, pretty easy to diagnose. It's really, you know, it's going to create these circular brown patches. Uh, that's the other thing that's fun about turf grass diseases that I failed to mention is the common name usually tells you what it is, right? I mean, the, the people that came up with these back in the early 1900s were just, you know, oh, look, there's a brown patch of grass. They call that brown patch, right? <laughs> spring dead spot, a dead spot of grass in the spring. Dollar spot, the size of a dollar coin, right? Large patch, a large patch of dead grass. <laughs> It's amazing, right? So brown patch caused by Rosoctonian. So that's the exact same fungus that causes large patch uh, in warm season grasses. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, uh, which is very common in warm season. But it produces these distinct lesions, right? This is what you're looking for. Uh, you'll probably start seeing these uh, depending on the weather. It could be middle of May, end of May, but definitely by the first of June, you'll start seeing brown patch. Uh, very, very common June through end of August. Usually by first of sep the middle of September, uh, we start getting a little bit cooler nights. The day length is getting less and less. Um, you see that kind of subside, but guaranteed to see it in the summer months, all right? Um, probably the biggest thing to talk about is if you go to turf files and look at the lawn maintenance calendar, you'll see this statement on there, and it's still there. Uh, it says, do not fertilize tall fescue after March 15th, right? Does anybody know why that's on there? Yep, right, that's, that's part of it, right? A big part of it is there, there's old research out there that says fertilizing tall fescue after this time frame makes brown patch more severe, right? Um, and when you go back and look in the research, there's multiple papers out there, uh, but they're, it conflicts, right? And all these papers are old. We're talking about papers that are what, 20, almost 20, 20 plus years old, right? You'll see one research paper that says high rate of nitrogen increased brown patch. And then you'll read another paper that says the lowest amount of brown patch was associated with the highest rate of nitrogen, right? Very conflicting. So 
Uh, over the past several years, this is a research project that we've worked on. We wanted to uh, look at this uh, in current times with the current varieties that we have. Top SU varieties have changed a lot over the years. Uh, so we did research uh, over the past several years. We actually just submitted that paper for uh, peer review research in a scientific journal uh, about a month ago. And as soon as that paper is accepted and published, we can go back and make that change on the website, right? But we don't make changes until it's been peer reviewed uh, and, and published, all right? Uh, but one thing we looked at, we looked at a couple different ways. We looked at the total amount of nitrogen. So in top SU, you know, you'll see that it says anywhere between three and four pounds of nitrogen per year. Uh, so we looked at anything from zero to six pounds total. Um, these bars don't mean anything to you other than uh, there was no differences in the amount of brown patch or in turf grass quality. We saw no significant differences in the amount of brown patch if we didn't fertilize it at all or if we fertilized a lot, right? It didn't matter. Um, the other thing was uh, we looked at a more realistic view where we looked at a total of three pounds per year and we looked at different timings. So we looked at putting out a pound in March, a pound in September, a pound, so you know, basically a pound in the spring, a couple pounds in the fall, two pounds in the spring, one pound in the fall, all in the spring, all in the fall, or spacing it out March through November. Uh, a lot of different ways there. Once again, no differences, right? We didn't see any increase in brown batch. Only in one year uh, in that first study did we see a slight increase, and that was at that, that six pound rate, but nobody's gonna do that, right? Uh, and then more realistic, even more so, is in, in, in combination with the fungicide program, right? Um, and this was at field day last year. Once again, this is 2018, not 2019. <clears throat> Looking at different amounts of nitrogen with and without a uh, fungicide. So heritage is very common for brown patch and tall fescue. Uh, you know, I guess I should have explained this from the get-go, right? When you see these slides like this, these, these data slides, there's a couple things you need to pay, pay attention to. The number one thing you need to do uh, is look for the non-treated control, right? So this is the plot that received nothing, right? Uh, it's called the control plot. And you can see how much disease it had in it, right? The other thing you'll notice is these little letters, and that has to do with statistical significance. So when a bar has the same letter, so you see all these bars with the letter A, uh, while, the, while they are numerically different, statistically they're really no different from one another, right? Uh, but when you, when you see these other bars with Bs, you can see obviously they're numerically different, and a lot of them there's not even any disease at all. Uh, but also statistically significant. Uh, so there's a couple things to look at. One is, is if, they, if you're on a fungicide program like with Heritage, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you're, you're not going to see any change. But the other thing to note is, look at this fertilizer alone. So this is amounts of nitrogen per month, right, during the summer months. <clears throat> so we did a quarter of a pound per month, a half a pound, and a full pound. And you can see there was no, that this full pound is kind of what to sneak out away from us. Uh, but statistically no different. We would never recommend somebody go out with a full pound of nitrogen uh, in, the, in June, July, and August on tall fescue. That's ridiculous, right? But in science, you have to look at the extremes, right? What's more realistic is like a quarter of a pound, right? So if you fertilize a tall fescue lawn, and you, the last time you fertilized it is March 15th by recommendations, and you don't fertilize again to September, that's what, not six months without any food? That's, that's tough for a plant, right? Especially if you've got a plant that's struggling from uh, disease or insect damage or something like that. The, the point is, it, it used to be that people lived in fear of putting just even a little bit of nitrogen out because they were afraid brown patch was going to explode. That's not the case. You can go out with like a quarter of a pound, just a little bit, just give it a little nudge, a little tickle, uh, and it'll help it regrow, put some new growth off right, uh, and, and recover from that damage uh, as, the, as the bottom, as the main point of, of this research. Is everybody good with that? All right, don't go ahead and get wild with it, just a little bit, all right? Uh, gray leaf spot, I want to mention this one because it's kind of a serious disease uh, on tall fescue in this area. It was extremely devastating last year to newly seeded tall fescue lawns, uh, and it's becoming more and more of an issue, all right? Completely different fungus from brown patch. Uh, gray leaf spot occurs later in the year, so we're talking like mid-August through the end of September uh, is when this one occurs. Um, conveniently, if you remember last year, we had several tropical systems and all that rain uh, during that time period. Uh, the humidity, if you remember, September was really muggy, stayed warm, longer than normal, uh, which is ideal conditions for this particular disease. Uh, you can see what it looks like on tall fescue. This is what it also looks like on St. Augustine grass, just showing you those, those little uh, leaf spots on the foliage that looks different than the brown patch, where you got those irregular lesions, right, uh, when you, you're trying to identify it on your own. Uh, the fungicides that we use for brown patch, those QOI fungicides like Heritage, don't work all that well. 
And that's where people are getting in trouble is a lot of homeowners at Top SMU rely heavily on the QOI fungicides for brown packs because they are phenomenal. But this is one hole in your program, if you will, and the great spot will sneak in and get you. So you have to go to a different chemical uh, if you're going to do that. And that's thiophenate methyl uh, is the one that works really well on that particular disease. All right. Uh, so that's the thing where you have to you can start your year out with uh, heritage. And then as you get later in the year, um, you might want to take mix in that product with it uh, to make sure you're covering all your bases, especially if you're out of site that has a known history uh, of gray leaf spot. Once again, you know, this is something that can really do a lot of damage to especially the newly seeded uh, lawns in, in the late summer, early fall. All right. Uh, just to show you how much damage it can do, there's our research plots. Uh, and you see those little green squares there? Those are the plots that were treated with the thiophenate method, the one fungicide that does work. The other ones were using products like heritage and whatnot, right? Completely wiped it out. You can see that's what it, it's just an example of what a leaf looks like. Uh, this is in Rollsville, uh, a pure seed testing, uh, fantastic uh, research facility out there, a Kirkcrest breeder. Uh, but she gets a really good, uh, Dr. Melody Frazier is the name, she gets a really lovely uh, great leaf spot out there. Uh, so we, we get, get, get good research, right? You've come to learn that plant pathologists are weird, right? We like to watch plants, right? Um, you know, and I have to be careful about that. You know, we go out to golf courses and we have to kind of hold our excitement back. You know, when you see a putting green that's completely devastated by a fungus, you know, yeah. And they don't like that too much, right? All right. So uh, that was that. And then how we, it was 1230. Can we wrap it up? Yep. That's what I figured. So the best thing to do instead, I'll just share these with you. Uh, I'll just click them real quick. But it shows you what large patch looks like, right? Um, gives you some cues for identifying it on your own. Shows you the conditions. I mean, this is all stuff you can read later. Um, fairy ring is another one to get a lot of questions about. Uh, I will talk about this real quick because it's funny, right? The mushrooms in your yard. So that's a very common question I get from folks. I have mushrooms in my yard. Uh, are they going to make me sick? Are they going to make my pets sick or my kids sick? The answer is yes and no. There are some that are very delicious, and there are others that will put you in the hospital, right? Uh, but fairy rings have been studied by humans for a really long time. That's what's interesting. I think Shakespeare describes it in one of his books. Uh, but if you go back in the old literature, uh, this is uh, coming from England. Uh, you know, uh, plucked from the fairy circle. A man saves his friend from the grip of a fairy ring. If you've never seen fairy rings, they actually cause dark green rings in turf. Uh, you know, the, the whole you, you can you can interpret this art however you want to. Um, you know, I'm thinking they're having an hallucinogenic experience with these mushrooms. Yeah. We saw these little fairies, right? But it's, it's interesting that it's that well documented because when you talk about other turf grass diseases, they really don't get documented until like the 1920s and 1930s. And especially they start getting documented in the 1950s post World War II, where we have explosion of suburban America and people start caring about their home lawns. Uh, and you see the documentation of that. So that's interesting to read about. But it shows you all the stuff in there if you want to go and, and look at it yourself. Uh, to, to learn about it. All right. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I didn't cover or I did cover? This is burning you up. Yep. Do you think um, chem lawns, lawn doctor, do, do they have their own test plans? And how do they come up to determine what they should put down, how much they can put down? Do they get with you guys? Or do yes, they, they consult with us. Yep. Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question to ask them. I can't, I won't answer that. <laughs> Everybody good? What's your line? I have a beer. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's the whole point. I love it. I, I love it a lot, actually. What is it? A beer. Because it recovers, it heals itself. Thank you for coming. Don't ask me that it heals itself all the time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all. But, it looks so but I did have to beat it out of my plant. Yeah. So that's the calm yeah. of a beer, guys. It's fighting that fight. But if you got kids and pets and stuff, it's fantastic because it, it heals up. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. Thank you.